Uh, our next speaker is Peter Rookner. Um, Peter uh, has been involved in sports medicine around Melbourne for a long time. He was one time club doctor for Melbourne Footy Club. He's been the club doctor. He's currently club doctor. He's the doctor for the Australian cricket team. And uh, thanks, Peter. You've got the got the team performing very well right at the moment. So you're obviously feeding them well. Uh, and uh, yeah, so Peter's developed a, a strong interest in the low carb, high fat approach for athletes. Thank you. Thanks, Rod. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. In, uh, in fact, uh, this occasion is really the, the sole reason that uh, Australia won the first Ashes Test, because uh, Rod and Z said, look, uh, you can come and speak at this conference, but uh, you know, you've, got to, uh, you've got to have won the first test, because otherwise you'll have no credibility. So I <laughs> sat the boys down before the first test, and I said, look, guys, you know, Ashes, you know, 22 million people, you know, wanting you to win, it's not important. The important thing is that I'm able to speak at this low carb conference and that uh, inspired the boys and you saw the results. So uh, that's why we won the first Ashes test. So Rod and uh, Z, you know, it's all yours, well done. Um, I have something in common with Z in that, uh, that I used to be the, uh, the Melbourne football club doctor and uh, apologies for those who aren't AFL fans, but uh, I'll give you some idea of how long ago I was the AFL, the Melbourne doctor, is that we made the finals every year that I was the club doctor. So uh, um, for those of you who don't follow AFL, Melbourne have probably been the worst team in the competition for the last, uh, the last 10 years, so that dates me a little bit. But uh, anyway, I'm sure they're going to do well under Z's uh, care. Um, look, I'm... Uh, Rod, Rod said we've got to talk a little bit about ourselves. I, you know, I hate doing that. I'm, you know, this is the modest type. But uh, how long have I got? Um, I'm a sports medicine physician, um, a, uh, which is now a full medical specialty in this country. Uh, I've been that for 30 odd years. I was a child prodigy, and uh, it, it, uh, I have a clinic here in, in Melbourne, and I've worked with. Uh, a lot of um, professional teams, uh, AFL teams, I mentioned Melbourne and uh, a couple of others. Um, I worked with Olympic teams, um, I was the Australian athletics team doctor for some time, I was an Australian swimming doctor, hockey doctor, uh, I've done five national teams now. I was the Socceroos doctor for uh, a number of years, went to the last World Cup with uh, the Socceroos. And then uh, I was headhunted to go to uh, Liverpool, Liverpool Football Club, which is an English Premier League club, uh, one of the sort of traditional giants of, uh, of, of English football. And I spent a couple of years there as the head of sports medicine and sports science. So I've been actually living in England for the last three years and uh, sort of slowly transitioning back to, uh, to beautiful Melbourne. So that's basically my, my history. Um, I've always had an interest in, uh, in nutrition. Um, Karen Inge, who's a very well-known uh, dietitian in, in Melbourne, and I put out, I think, the first Australian sports nutrition book uh, nearly 30 years ago. Again, I was, you know, very young at the time, and um, that, you know, I've always had an interest. And but basically, and, and you know, sports nutrition became a bit boring in a way because it was all just, uh, you know, carbohydrates and fluids. That were the only sort of two stories, really. You know, you, you needed lots of. Uh, Lots of Gatorade and lots of uh, pasta. That was sort of the story for, for 30 years. And um, so I sort of, you know, well, I wouldn't say I lost interest, but I wasn't as sort of passionate about uh, sports nutrition maybe as I, I had been. I kept telling people they've got to have lots of carbs. If you want to mar run a marathon, you've got to carb load, um, all that sort of stuff. So that was the, that was the story for, for 30 years. And I guess uh, just talking about my personal journey, um, you know, without being melodramatic, my life changed about 18 months ago when, uh, when I heard that uh, Tim Noakes uh, had gone low carb. Now, Professor Tim Noakes, some of you may have heard of, is, is a South African sports scientist and sports clinician um, who's probably the most highly respected sports scientist in the world. I think that's fair to say. He's, uh, he's, he speaks at every conference. Uh, he's published some wonderful research and he's someone who always challenges the norm. And uh, he was the first person to really point out that we were uh, overhydrating a lot of our athletes and causing uh, significant problems with hyponatremia. He, uh, he's famous for his central governor model of, uh, of fatigue. And uh, he uh, came out about 18 months ago and said that he'd been, uh, been eating low carb for the previous uh, 12 to 18 months. And he had uh, previously developed type 2 diabetes 
And this is despite, you know, eating a, what is regarded as a very healthy diet. He was a runner, he ran, he's run lots of marathons and comrades marathons, which is the, uh, the big event in, in South Africa. And uh, despite that, he was uh, feeling poor. Um, his running wasn't going well. And uh, he, for various reasons, decided to, uh, to go low carb. Now, this is a guy who is the author of a book called The Law of Running, which is the Bible of, uh, of runners. Anyone who runs seriously has read The Law of Running. And there's a lot in that book about the importance of carbohydrate. And uh, the next edition will be very different, I think. But um, the current uh, edition still has that much to Tim's embarrassment. And Tim came out and said that uh, you know, he, he uh, raved about the benefits, his own personal experience, of, uh, of low carb. Uh, that he'd uh, lost weight, that his energy had improved, his running performance had improved, and uh, most significantly, his diabetes had reversed, and that he no longer uh, was, strictly speaking, a diabetic when he was on this, uh, on this diet. And I thought to myself, you know, Tim Noakes is a bloody smart guy. He's a hell of a lot smarter than I am, and, uh, you know, he's come to this conclusion, so there must be something in it. So I thought, well, let's, you know, let's do a bit of research. So I went and bought... Uh, this uh, the book on the uh, on the left, good calories, bad calories, or it, uh, the other title is Diet Delusion. It's the same book, just different titles. One US, one UK, and there's a lay version of why we get fat. But uh, I read this book by Gary Torbs. Now Gary Torbs, most of you have probably read this stuff, but uh, he's a he's not a doctor. He's a science writer, and um, he's an American who basically uh, spent five years researching this uh, this book, and it's. I've read a lot of books in my life, and this is the most amazing book that I've ever read. And it's, it's changed my life, and uh, it will change a lot of people. It's changed a lot of people's lives. And in this, in this book, Good Calories, Bad Calories, Gary Torbs talks about, first of all, the, uh, the differences between you know, low-fat and low-carb, and, and uh, the science, reviews all the science uh, of those two uh, particular philosophies. But more interestingly than that, he talks about the politics and I think Gary's going to talk a little bit later on about uh, how we came to where we are now. But it was, it's absolutely fascinating to, to learn the reasons why the low-fat argument won out 30 years ago over the low-carb argument. It's actually quite a depressing book. As a, as a member of the medical profession, I felt quite embarrassed and ashamed of my uh, profession that they had been conned into this sort of uh, this state. But uh, absolutely amazing book. And uh, I thought, hmm... This is a bit challenging. You know, first of all, I've got Tim Noakes. Now I've read this book. Um, gee, what am I uh, going to do? So I thought, well, the next thing to do is, uh, is to try it myself. Now, um, at the time I was uh, 60 years old, I uh, had probably put on you know, half a kilogram a year for the previous sort of 50, 20 years, um, as you do. Uh, middle age spread, I think they call it. And despite eating what would be regarded as a healthy diet, you know, lots of pasta, rice, cereals, um, etc., you know, what we're all encouraged to eat, and yet, and doing a moderate amount of exercise, I wasn't a huge exerciser, but I'd, you know, I'd exercise regularly. Um, and despite that, I kept on gradually putting on weight to the point where my kids were making a few little digs about my uh, uh, the state of my uh, my midriff. The other thing that, that motivated me was that at the same age, my father had developed type 2 diabetes and subsequently went on to have enormous problems uh, with, uh, with his diabetes. And uh, so I thought, well, really, I should be trying to do everything I can to, uh, to avoid that, uh, that condition. So, uh, so there I was. I was um, about five months pregnant at the time. Um, <laughs> and um, I was 93 kilograms, which uh, is a lot more than I, than I should have been. And as I said, you know, just become a sort of a a subtle uh, increase over the years and this is, uh, this is me on the bench at, uh, at Liverpool and uh, probably wasn't a very good look uh, to inspire the, uh, the players or the supporters but anyway. Um, so I decided to do a, my own experiment and uh, went low carb and uh, did some, did, tested all my bloods beforehand because I was going to be a one person uh, research experiment, um, went low carb. So what did, uh, what did I do? Um, well, I stopped, I mean, I don't need to tell all you people, but I'll very quickly go through it. I stopped all the obvious uh, carbs, so I stopped rice, pasta, potatoes, bread, cereals, fruit juices, uh, all the things that, you know, I, were basically the sta my staple diet for the previous 20 years and the staple diet that we're, we're told we should be eating. Stopped all those things um, 
and my meals basically I went back to probably the way my parents used to eat, you know, uh, bacon and eggs for breakfast. Um, you know, I often, as a result, wouldn't be hungry at lunchtime. I remember, you know, in the, in the bad old days when I'd have cereal for breakfast, by, by midday I'd be looking at my watch saying, God, is it lunchtime yet? I've got to have something to eat. Whereas now, I, uh, half the time I forget about lunch. And um, if I do have lunch, I'm, you know, if I'm out or something, I'll just have some, you know, cold meats and a salad or, uh, or some nuts or some cheese or something like that. And then for dinner, this is a fairly typical dinner, I'll have uh, fish or meat with... Uh, with uh, green veg, uh, broccoli, beans, uh, cauliflower rice, or uh, cauliflower rice is the best invention. It's fantastic. Instead of rice, you just chop up cauliflower and use it as, as rice. It's, it's great. So, uh, um, and then if I wanted uh, dessert, I'd just have some berries, um, lots of cream, uh, butter, you know, cook in butter or coconut oil. Uh, I actually got into cooking for the first time in my life, really. Cooking had always been a bit of a chore, uh, but I actually enjoy enjoy cooking now and do quite a lot of it. So, so I went, you know, fairly standard, sort of low carb, um, and uh, uh, really enjoyed it. And, you know, after the first week when you get on the scales and you've lost a kilogram, you know, it's incredibly motivating. You think, uh, wow, you know, this is actually uh, working. And uh, that basically happened every week. Uh, I lost a kilogram a week for about 12 weeks and, uh, and dropped, I uh, actually got down to about 79. I dropped about 14 altogether. And everyone sort of said, no, you're too, too skinny, too skinny. So I'm, I'm back at about 81 now. But um, so I did that over a, over a three month period. And it wasn't at all. People said, oh, that must have been really hard. And I said, no, I've never eaten better in my life. Um, I really uh, enjoyed my food and uh, enjoyed preparing it. And as I said, it was incredibly rewarding. So how did I feel? I felt great. Uh, my exercise capacity improved dramatically, even before I lost a lot of weight. So I don't think it was just the weight. I, uh, I remember one day coming back to my wife and saying, I felt like I could have, could have run forever. And I'm not a great runner or a particularly good runner, but I just had that feeling that I could keep going uh, indefinitely. So that was certainly a, a big change for me. So uh, I finished up uh, half the man I used to be, and um, you know I've maintained that, uh, that ever since. Now, again, I, I'm not, I don't want to sort of bore you with my own story, but uh, I just want to use it as an example, because a lot of people say, uh, as he referred to, well, what about your, you know, your, your lipids? What about your cholesterol? And you know, you can't eat high fat diets. Dangerous. You know, you're gonna have a heart attack tomorrow, and so on. And certainly, most of my medical colleagues are convinced that I'm gonna drop dead of a heart attack. So, uh, uh, if I survive this talk, then you know, hopefully, uh, I'll be okay. <laughs> sure, a few doctors in the room, I might be okay. Um, but um, so I thought, well, you know, let's let's have a look and see what happens to my my blood. So now let me just quickly take you through again, and that's not, you know. My blood tests are not that important, but I just want to use it as an example. And um, so October 15 is when I started my diet. December 17 was sort of, sort of uh, a couple of months later when I'd been going pretty hard at it for, uh, for 10 weeks or so. And then May, obviously, a few months later when I was just in a sort of a, a normal state, if you like. Um, and I think most people would agree who have experienced in low carbs, these are very typical results uh, from a low carb diet. In other words, your total cholesterol remains about the same, maybe even goes up a little bit, uh, as does your LDL cholesterol, which is supposedly your bad cholesterol. And people will talk during the morning about uh, today about uh, the differences uh, between HDL and LDL and so on. So I won't bore you with all that. But as far as I'm concerned, the only the two important measurements are HDL and triglycerides. And because they're the HDL, you want to have as high as possible, and the triglycerides, I believe, are the very dangerous. Um, part of the whole lipid thing because that's, uh, that's an indicator of, uh, of very small uh, lipoproteins that are causing all the damage. So let's just have a look at my triglycerides there, uh, which I think is, as I said, the key component of all this. I started off at 2.13. The, the most labs will tell you that greater than 2 is abnormal. It's abnormally high. Um, I actually probably think greater than 1 is too high, but anyway, that's, uh, that's by the by. Um, so the general standard is two. So after that, those first uh, 10 weeks, I, I hadn't changed. And I thought, oh, I was really disappointed. You know, I thought, wow, my triglycerides are gonna be fantastic. And, uh, and uh, I didn't, so I did some further reading and it seems that when you're in a rapid weight loss phase, if you like, you're, you're mobilizing a lot of your fat, a lot of your free fatty acids and, and, uh, and your triglycerides don't change. And so I felt a bit better after that. And then as you can see, a few months later, when I was just in a stable you know, uh, weight maintenance phase, if you like, my triglycerides went down dramatically, you know, from 2.16 to, to 1.3. Um, so I felt much better about that, and that's what I had expected. 
but I hadn't really understood about the rapid weight loss phase. And uh, we believe that this triglyceride to HDL ratio is really important. And uh, as you can see, mine went from 2.13 to 1.13. So I felt very comfortable with that. I don't really care that my cholesterol has gone up a little bit. Now, my, if I went to most doctors with that, they would uh, get extremely concerned and put me on those wonderful drugs called statins, um, which is uh, somewhat similar to rat poison. And um, I, uh, I obviously haven't done that, and it doesn't worry me at all. And in fact, uh, the higher my cholesterol, you know, within reason, I'm, I'm quite happy with, because it's been shown that uh, people actually with, uh, with low cholesterol uh, live uh, or die earlier than those with, with high once you get to the age of 50. So I, I think you need cholesterol, your brain needs cholesterol. I think one of the reasons we have uh, this epidemic of, uh, of dementia and Alzheimer's is that we've gone crazy about uh, lowering cholesterol and uh, that's one of the side effects we'll, which will eventually be proven but uh, hasn't been as yet. So that's, uh, that's my lipid story. Uh, my glucose story didn't really change to, other than the insulin level. If you look at the difference, 11.2 initially at, uh, was, was halved exactly after uh, 10, 11 weeks of, uh, of dieting. Uh, that HB1AC is, is that indicator of your average sort of glucose level. So I didn't have a major problem with, uh, with, with diabetes at, the, at that stage, but I was very happy to have my, my uh, um, insulin down. Now these are liver function, and I don't want to want to again bore you with these, but one of the common things in, uh, in when you have a high carbohydrate diet is you get a condition known as fatty liver or fatty deposits in your liver. And uh, that's indicated by uh, abnormal uh, enzymes in the liver, these liver function tests. And again, I won't bore you with the sort of technical details, but you can see there that in 2005 and 2007, times when I was on this high carbohydrate diet, my uh, enzymes, my ALT uh, and my AST, uh, or my ALT in particular, were quite high. And uh, I was sort of told at the time, oh, you've probably got fatty liver, and I, I didn't really look into it, I probably ignored it and pretended it didn't exist really, and I didn't worry too much about it. Um, and uh, just coincidentally, when I had my blood tests uh, uh, for after the, the diet, um, there was my previous liver function test came up on the on the uh, on the sheet because you know the same lab did it. And uh, look at the difference in my ALT. Uh, there is no longer any fatty deposits uh, in my liver, and I no longer have fatty liver. So that's uh, just another little additional uh, perk to uh, to this. Okay, enough about me. Um, as uh, Rod said, for the last 18 months I've been the doctor for the Australian cricket team, and um, uh, which has been a fantastic experience. Uh, I just did uh, the Ashes tour in England, 86 days straight with uh, you know 18 of my closest friends in uh, hotel rooms for 86 nights, and uh, but it was a fantastic experience to uh, to go through that. Um, I started off my first tour with the team was uh, pre-diet, so. Uh, I was, you know, my 93 kilograms when I was on tour uh, in the UAE uh, in the middle of last year. And then my next tour was after I'd lost all my weight, which was in India earlier this year. And uh, not surprisingly, it caused some comment. Um, so a number of the players who would come up to me and say, Oh, Doc, you've lost all this weight. You know, tell me about it and how would you go about it? And I was very reluctant to sort of get into the whole diet thing. I was fairly new in the job. I didn't want to sort of barge in. And uh, they've had a dietitian, a very well-known dietitian, um, and uh, who'd been looking after the team for some time. And I didn't want to tread on any toes, so I tried to keep it very low profile. But you guys have come up to me and asked me about uh, about the diet. And eventually, a number of them decided, gave them some things to read, and a number of them decided they wanted to try uh, to try the diet. And so I just want to give you sort of just four little uh, case studies of, uh, of the cricketers. Obviously, I can't uh, name names, and then the names are not important. But just to give you examples of uh, of the sort of and these are you know these are elite athletes, professional athletes. They do nothing else other than train and play cricket. Um, they're regarded. If you're in the Australian Test team, for those of you who are not familiar, I mean that's the you know the ultimate. Every kid in the country wants to be in the Australian uh, Australian Test team, and uh, you would imagine that these people are you know incredibly healthy and uh, and fit. Well, maybe not. Okay, so the first one uh, is a guy who's uh, had a long history of, he's in his early 30s now, uh, he's had a long history of, he's battled his weight the whole way through his, uh, his career. Um, as a result of, of you know, uh, 
a lot of concentration on his weight. He had a real sort of fat phobia, uh, which he admitted. He said he'd become obsessed about uh, about not uh, not having any fat. Uh, I guess people have been hammering for years. You're too fat. You're too fat. You're too fat. You know, lose some weight and you'll be better. Um, and uh, he also had he has a horrendous history of injury, what we call soft tissue injury, so muscle uh, injuries in particular. He's had 27 muscle injuries uh, in his test career and missed approximately half of the tests that he could have played he's missed through injury. So his, re his career really has been blighted by these injuries. So he became very interested in the low carb diet, went, became, uh, you know, got into it pretty heavily and uh, went low carb, lost a few kilograms, but more importantly said he, he felt fantastic, his energy levels were great. And the past 18 months has probably been the best 18 months of his, uh, of his cricket career. And he is the first person, he's a very passionate advocate of low carb and uh, has come out publicly and talked about it a little bit and um, is uh, very positive about the whole uh, impact. Cricket number two was a younger guy who, uh, when, I, when we got to India, had been injured for some time and as a result had put on quite a bit of weight. And uh, you know, when, when I say he was overweight, he's not overweight by you know by middle-aged uh, gentleman standards, but uh, he was certainly overweight for a, for a cricketer. And uh, he his weight had blown up to 84 kilograms. He's a short, sort of stocky guy. Um, and his skin folds. Now, skin folds. Uh, a lot of you would know about skin folds because you're in the fitness industry. But skin folds are what most sort of uh, sporting teams use to measure as an sort of equivalent of body fat levels. So we, uh, especially the pinch test. And there's eight sites around the around the body, and that you add those uh, those eight sites, and uh, that's your sum of skin folds, or sometimes seven, sometimes eight, depending on the the, the uh, preference. So um, his skin folds, and so that's a good measure of uh, of fat, because if you know if you're losing, one of the criticisms is oh they just lose muscle, and uh, obviously you know if you are losing skin folds, you're losing uh, you're losing fat. And uh, so he went on the diet very passionately um, for uh, a few months, lost seven kilograms and lost uh, 27 skin folds, which is an unbelievable amount, massive amount. I'm sure those of you in the fitness industry in the audience would appreciate that uh, that sort of thing just doesn't happen to an already fit elite athlete. And uh, he's now uh, very committed to, to that. His training has improved dramatically. He's training, training twice as much as a result because he feels so much better. His endurance has improved. Um, he's playing uh, incredibly well at the moment. And uh, he was fantastic last weekend. And um, unfortunately, he still opens his trap too much, but that's all right. He only took up the diet uh, halfway through the Ashes tour. And um, since then, has lost, also lost seven kilograms and 23 skin folds and uh, feels fantastic and is playing, uh, playing good cricket. This is uh, probably the most interesting case. This is a young guy who three years ago had to stop playing cricket. So this is a professional you know, Australian cricketer who was on the verge of the test team at that time, had to stop playing cricket because of knee pain. And uh, he was unable to train. He saw every specialist around. Uh, no one could work out what was wrong with his knee. Had scans, had an arthroscopy, uh, couldn't find anything. Then he developed pain in his other knee, and then he uh, developed pain in his elbow. And eventually he was diagnosed with what we call a seronegative arthropathy, which is basically a type of rheumatoid arthritis without uh, being a classic rheumatoid. It's a whole other group of them. And um, he was started on, on medication. The medications were methotrexate and prednisolone, which are incredibly powerful. Prednisolone is cortisone. So this is having large doses of cortisone. Um, and methotrexate was originally an anti-cancer drug, I think very powerful drugs. And they didn't really help, despite those two very strong drugs, still unable to play first-class cricket. He then was put on a drug called Enbrel, which is a fairly new drug. It's got an anti-tumor necrosis factor uh, drug, uh, very expensive, about $15,000 a year. And um, he was on fortnightly injections of this Enbrel. And he said to me that uh, it had really helped. He was able to train, but not at the level he wanted to, but he was able to train and play. And he said in this fortnight, he said by about day 10 or 11, his knee would start to ache and he would know, ah, oh, yes, it's time for my Enbrel injection. And he would inject himself every fortnight. Well, he got onto the diet and uh, he was very assiduous, very dedicated, didn't have any carbs. And three weeks later, he sort of sheepishly came up to me and uh, he said, Doc, oh, um, I forgot to take my Enbrel last week. I said, what do you mean? He said, oh, I, said, I didn't get any pain, so I forgot to take it. That was three weeks ago. Well, that's now 43 weeks ago. 
He's not taken Enbrel since. He's not taken an aspirin. He's doubled his training load. He's lost weight. Uh, he still can't make any runs, but uh, he's, you know, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> but uh, um, he's, uh, he's a new man. And he feels fantastic and uh, he's totally off his medication. So for a start, he's saving the Australian taxpayer 15,000 bucks a year, so we should be very grateful. Um, but, you know, they talk about this diet being expensive. Well, you know, it's cheap, isn't it, really, compared to, uh, to the drugs that are required. And one of the things that, you know, that the dietitians who all have this sort of spiel that, uh, you know, the, the Australian dietitian and some of the state dietitians were very angry about all this, uh, this diet stuff. And, and they said that they have a number of sort of standard responses to this low carb. You know, one is what's it doing to your lipids. Uh, one is that your brain needs glucose and without glucose your brain can't function. Well, in that case, I haven't been functioning for some time. Which, you know, some, some people might uh, say it's correct, but um, uh, and clearly it does. And the other thing they say about it is that uh, high carbohydrate diet is inflammatory. So you get a lot of inflammatory diseases. Well, here's an inflammatory disease that was probably caused by low carb diet. And having stopped the low carb diet, it's been more effective than the most powerful anti-inflammatory drugs in the world. So pretty dramatic case, I think. So, uh, um, so we came to the final test in, uh, in the oval and the fifth test in the ashes. And uh, we had two century makers who uh, the, uh, didn't have a car between the, the three of us. So we've even uh, got the captain interested, we've taken him down to the health food shop and uh, he now snacks on, uh, on almonds rather than uh, bread and, uh, and he's feeling a lot better. The next challenge is the coach and uh, once, he <laughs> once he discovered that, uh, that beer was full of carbohydrates, he said, ah oh, no doc, can't do that. <laughs> so um, I've continued to be very interested in, uh, in this, this whole area. Um, I read uh, constantly, I've probably read 30 books on uh, on this uh, topic, uh, the last two have been uh, Jimmy Moore's book, Cholesterol Clarity, and, uh, and David Perlmutter's uh, book, Grain Brain, which is, I guess, a follow-up to, to Wheat Belly, really. And uh, fascinating books. Um, I've uh, written some uh, medical articles uh, challenging the beliefs in sports nutrition, and I've done a podcast with, with Tim Noakes, which is on the British Journal of Sports Medicine website which has, become the, has been the most popular podcast uh, they've ever had. So, uh, you know, that's my own sort of interest. And um, obviously, uh, you know, I'm not saying that uh, the reason the, the cricket team is uh, going so well is that uh, a lot of us are low carb, but, uh, you know, I don't want to rub it in. Um, <laughs> okay, so now I suppose I should get on to what I was asked to talk about, which is um, the effect of low carb, high fat diet and performance. And, Look, I don't want to, it's, it's fairly technical and I don't want to bore you with all the technical details. I'll just give you a summary really. There are lots of papers out there, lots of research papers out there, most of which are very poorly designed, poorly, uh, poor research. So it's very hard to actually, and I would say that there's really no proof about any of this, uh, these issues about exercise and low carb. Certainly the cricketers would tell you that their energy levels, that their performance has improved. Um, whether that's due to their weight loss or whether it's just the, the, the carb diet it is hard to say. But there's certainly been no negative effects in sport of any of the athletes I know that have gone on that. So let's briefly look. And the areas I'm going to look at is the sort of three areas really are endurance, strength and what we call high intensity intermittent exercise. And uh, in the endurance exercise we want to look at short term adaptation and longer term. Now what I mean by that is a lot of the research they put them on a, uh, on a low carb, high fat diet for a couple of days and then retest them. So you do a test, test of their uh, time to exhaustion or their, uh, their time trial, put them on three days of low carb, uh, high fat and then retest them. And uh, not surprisingly, um, that didn't help uh, because I think as we know, you need time to adapt. And it probably was in most cases negative to athletic performance. So that's not a good idea. So if you want to, if you've got an Olympic uh, final coming up, you don't want to go uh, low carb, high fat for the first time for the few days beforehand. So not surprising uh, results. The, the more interesting one is, is the longer term. So this is in uh, longer than a week. I mean, most of us would think that you probably need three to four weeks minimum to adapt for your metabolism to sort of become fat dominant, if you like, rather than carbohydrate dominant. But these, we're, I'm just looking at the studies here that were longer than seven days. Um, and again, divided into two types, the, the, what we call the moderate intensity, so the endurance running, um, so you know, marathons and, and so on, 
so what we call 60 to 80 percent of your VO2 max, which is your maximum oxygen capacity. And uh, in these studies, the majority of the studies, and I said many of them are flawed, but the majority of them show a prolonged time to exhaustion. So if you if you do a run, you're on a high carbohydrate diet, you might uh, you know get exhausted after 12 minutes or whatever, or 20 minutes or what, and at a particular speed, then you go on a on a uh, low carb, high fat diet for seven days or more, and you retest and the time to exhaustion improves. So you can run longer until you get exhausted. And that's been shown fairly standardly in, the, in these studies. So for your average endurance runner, marathoner, triathlete, ultra endurance runner, I don't think there's much doubt that the low carb, high fat diet is better. Well, certainly no worse and probably better because you've got enough fat stores for you to run for hours and hours and hours. You don't have enough carbohydrate stores to run for very long. So it makes sense for an endurance athletes, and many of the world's top endurance athletes have now gone low carb, high fat. If it's higher intensity, there doesn't seem to be an improvement. So that's, that's uh, when you're looking at uh, really high intensity, you know, 1500 meter running or something like that, it, there may not be uh, as much improvement or, or no improvement. As far as strength exercise goes, well, a lot of people argue that well, your strength will decrease because you need carbohydrates for strength. The two studies that have been done, and there's only two, uh, that uh, have shown no change in the strength on the low carb, high fat uh, diet. Now the interesting one is, is what we call high intensity intermittent exercise. So what, that's really football, you know, basketball, running up and down, uh, high intensity intermittent stuff. And uh, the, the only studies have been when people have gone short duration, low carb, high fat, so not really valid uh, studies. The results have been varied. We need to do further research on that. I know one AFL club this year basically went low carb during the week and supplemented with carbs on match day. And they found that to be very satisfactory and they are a club that performed way above expectation this year. Now there were probably many reasons for that, but uh, they were very happy with their, with their low carb during the week uh, diet. And obviously they're training hard during the week and they had no problems coping with, uh, with low carb. As I said, there's a lot of problems with, uh, with the research. Uh, they're mainly short term dietary change. There's incredibly, some people call low carb, you know, sort of 45% carbs, you know, and uh, so on. So there's weird definitions of, of low carb um, and, uh, and high fat. There's various exercise intensities. Some of them are quite low intensity, some of them are quite high intensity. And then there's probably a difference between trained subjects and untrained subjects. So there's still a lot of confusion out there and we need to do a lot more research. Unfortunately, the funding of research, research is generally funded by drug companies or by, uh, by food companies and neither of those particularly want to fund uh, these sort of uh, things. So it's difficult to get good research done. So that's really a summary of the effects of, uh, of low carb, uh, high fat on, on exercise performance. The jury is basically still out. But certainly in the endurance, ultra endurance area, I don't think there's much doubt that it is uh, beneficial. Now, I just want to finish by, uh, by playing you a trailer from a movie. Um, and this is a movie that's uh, coming out in the next month or so around the world. It'll be uh, available online. It's called Serial Killers, uh, C-E-R-E-A-L, Killers. And it's uh, there's a young Irish guy called Donald who, uh, it's a story of his own personal uh, adventure into, uh, into low carb. And it involves uh, primarily Tim Noakes as his sort of treating uh, doctor and with a few cameo appearances from uh, some members of the Australian cricket team. Um, that actually finished doing the movie when, uh, when Donald got in touch with me and I said, uh, look, a number of the Aussie cricket boys are into it, they'd love to, you know, they'd be supportive of the movie. And he said, oh, would they record something to support the movie? You know, and so he could play it as a sort of a promotion thing. And he came over to London and uh, filmed us all. And uh, he was so excited by what they said that he changed the movie and incorporated what they said into the, uh, into the movie. So we'll just try the technical aspects of this. I'm responsible for writing all this and I don't believe it anymore. When my dad gets sick, Surprised us all. Ex-sportsman, lean, fit, healthy, never drank, boom, heart attack. I wanted to know why that happened. What I found shocked me. The average consumer is eating less uh, fat in their diet. They are eating uh, more carbohydrate in their diet and they've got rampant 
increases in obesity, diabetes, heart disease. I found out that a lot of what I thought I knew was what you can only describe as lies. I've always been very cynical about diets. For 28 days, I'm going to completely disregard the food pyramid. I'm going to gorge on fat. That's good. That's good. We've been lied to about cholesterol for long. Some people don't understand how it works. This magic in fat. In my view, the prudent diet does not prevent heart disease. It causes it. And certainly it contributes to diabetes and obesity in a major way. I'm controlling my diabetes without treatment. Meat, fish, nuts, eggs, those in my view should be the core food. We're going to prove that fat is good. I feel a lot better. I've lost a lot of weight during the time without even trying. My favourite is um, a steak with nice pieces of fat on it. And uh, I'm quite confident in 10 years time that uh, the Western society will be embracing this uh, low carb, high fat concept. I'm just going to try and get to the bottom of how I can drop dead healthy. Just don't fear fat. So that's a little taste of uh, serial killers. You think I've got a movie career in me or not? <laughs> Thanks very much.